In this video we're going to discuss the historical context behind the emergence of the European Union as well as the ideological underpinnings behind British Euroscepticism which ultimately resulted in the British vote to leave. Now this is not going to be a political video, we're not going to discuss the actual referendum. I'm not actually going to talk about anything before the year 2000 as I don't feel it's actually historically relevant. If you were to ask a journalist they give you a rather reductionist answer as to why Britain voted to leave the EU. Some vague claims about it being some kind of backlash against globalisation, immigration, a reaction to the Eurozone recession, the handling of the migrant crisis. But of course this is lazy and irrelevant and it fails to give the public any kind of understanding of these issues. Without any kind of historical context into the ideas involved, it's impossible to have a meaningful understanding of these events. I'm going to approach this question as a historian and ask questions like, where did the European Union come from in the first place? What ideas were behind it and where did they come from? Why did Euroscepticism thrive in the UK while the continent saw such a passionate post-war drive towards integration? And in that atmosphere, why did Britain decide to join in the first place? Why were the other European countries initially so keen to have Britain join as essentially the leader of the bloc? And then later, particularly in the case of France under de Gaulle, become reluctant to let Britain in at all? Now to really get a handle on these issues, we need to go back quite a long way. Some rather fanciful claims have been made that we can track the cause of European integration back to 1464, when the then King of Bohemia proposed a kind of alliance or union of European Christian nations in order to mount a more effective resistance against the Turks. The Ottomans at this point, of course, were rampaging through Southeast Europe, ultimately getting as far as Vienna, and seemed to many to be an unstoppable force and an existential threat towards the continent, and perhaps Christianity in general. It's fascinating to think the Turks were once seen like this, when we consider the centuries of relative decline that ended with the Ottoman Empire being seen as the sick man of Europe, and causing constant paranoia in Britain that it could collapse at any moment, threatening the, the balance of power on the continent, to the extent that the Crimean War was fought purely to protect Turkey from Russian aggression, the Russian bear of course being seen as the great threat of that time. I don't really consider this example relevant to the question, I think this is more wishful thinking on the part of European Federalists. I would argue that the drive towards European integration begins during the Napoleonic Wars and particularly their aftermath. Napoleon himself therefore represents the next major proponent of European integration that I'm going to discuss. Following his second and final defeat and capture at Waterloo, Napoleon was exiled to the British island of St Helena in the South Atlantic, a kind of forced retirement. During his time there, he spent some time mulling over the European question and has been quoted as saying, I wish to found a European system, a European code of laws, a European judiciary. There would be but one people in Europe. And that furthermore, Europe, thus divided into nationalities freely formed and free internally, peace between states would have become easier. The United States of Europe would become a possibility. I think there's some considerable irony here. This phrase clearly illustrates Napoleon has been influenced by the American Revolution. When you consider how aggressively anti-American the cause of European integration has often been throughout its history, particularly in the French case, it's strange to hear such an unguarded statement, the United States of Europe. Now speaking of America, William Penn, after which of course the state of Pennsylvania is named, also suggested a European Parliament should be formed in order to prevent such wars from happening in the future. Now I'm being slightly controversial here, but I would argue that there's more than a passing resemblance here. I don't just mean in terms of a federation as being some kind of political model. For example, if we talk about the so-called founding fathers of the European Union, that's a blatant rip-off of the founding fathers of the United States and of the American Constitution, Jefferson, Washington and so forth. Similarly, you consider the European flag. It's often claimed to be rather arbitrary in that the stars themselves don't symbolise anything particular it's just there to suggest some kind of unity. But take a look at this early American flag. I think there's more than a passing resemblance. In this case, of course, the 13 stars represent the original 13 British colonies that declared independence from the British Empire. I, of course, prefer this flag. Now, back on topic. Now, during the Napoleonic Wars, of course, France's principal enemy was Great Britain, which, being the first country to industrialise, had enormous economic influence in Europe, which gave it the ability to fund the war efforts of other military powers in Europe. And in the case of Russia, Russia was in many ways an economic vassal state of Britain, 
and therefore hugely tied into the British desire to destroy revolutionary France. Now Napoleon, seeking to isolate the continent from British economic influence, attempts to wall in the island of shopkeepers with a trade embargo, the so-called continental system. I don't think it's so far-fetched to argue that this was the beginning of European protectionism. This was understandable in the sense that, during this period, free trade was essentially a byword for British dominance, as the other great powers had yet to fully industrialise. It was therefore understandable that a European power would seek to create barriers to trade. Following the Napoleonic Wars, we of course come to the Congress of Vienna. This was a conference of the European powers, designed to redraw the borders of Europe and establish a lasting peace on the continent, following the devastation of the French Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars. As a result of the Congress of Vienna, a new loose confederation of German states was formed. The old association, the so-called Holy Roman Empire, sometimes called the First Reich, was destroyed by Napoleon, who created the Confederation of the Rhine, basically a vassal state. This German confederation was partly a result of the Romantic nationalism that was emerging at the time, a drive towards a unified nation-state for Germans. But an interesting feature of this confederation was the so-called Zollverein. This was a customs union which allowed for free trade amongst the German states, but erected trade barriers around this single market. I think in a lot of ways this is a precursor to the common external tariff of the European Union that we know today. Encouraging closer economic relations inside the walled garden, but providing protection from external competition. The Congress of Vienna also established the Concert of Europe. The Concert of Europe was intended as a kind of forum for dialogue between the great powers of Europe, including Russia of course, and its principal aim was to maintain the balance of power in Europe. It was believed that if the great powers worked to prevent any one of their number becoming excessively powerful, in relative terms, this would prevent something like the Napoleonic Wars from happening ever again. The Concert of Europe, I think, represents the diplomatic or political influence on later European integration. Later in the 19th century, however, the concert system broke down. The century between the defeat of Napoleon and the outbreak of the First World War is generally referred to as Pax Britannica, this was a period in which the British Empire enjoyed unquestioned global dominance. Britain's principal foreign policy goal was still to maintain the balance of power in Europe, but only to intervene if it felt that balance was seriously under threat. It was more focused on promoting global free trade and protecting its overseas empire. This policy was known as splendid isolation. It was particularly notable under Disraeli. Though nominally Britain acted as the global policeman during this period, it was more concerned with protecting the sea lanes, its most important trade routes, rather than becoming entangled in European alliances. German unification in 1871 created a powerful new rival to Britain's economic and military dominance. Britain was keen to contain Germany, particularly in the colonial sphere, while the German Empire, this new nation-state, was determined to upset the global order and claim its place in the sun, by which it meant obtaining some kind of colonial empire, particularly in Africa, which it felt had been cheated from simply as a result of its relatively late unification. Britain still tried to avoid European alliances, although it wasn't adverse to making friends when it suited outside of Europe. The Anglo-Japanese alliance, for example, in which both countries had something to gain and little to lose, Similarly, although there was something of an Anglo-American rivalry, there was something of an early special relationship as well. Not just in terms of the obvious cultural and political similarities, the United States inherited from Britain a set of economic ideals known as the Anglo-Saxon model. The Anglo-Saxon model is vociferously free trade. Protectionism is an anathema to British and American thinkers during this period. The Anglo-Saxon model demanded a night watchman state as well as a low regulation environment. We'll come to see later on how this would ultimately become a critical ideological flashpoint between Britain and the rest of the continent, particularly France. Pax Britannica effectively ended with the outbreak of World War I. Although Britain was probably the most powerful country in the world up until the Second World War, its unparalleled dominance was clearly over and was effectively bankrupted by the venture. The war to end all wars, as it was perhaps unwisely called, was the first total war in history. Entire societies and economies were turned towards supporting industrial slaughter 
on a scale that had never been seen before. Although Britain and France had won, both countries suffered from an enormous loss of life, and in the French case, destruction of infrastructure and the loss of swathes of agricultural land. Following the Treaty of Versailles, Germany, of course, suffered far worse economically. We've all seen the images of the post-war hyperinflation. People going down the shops with a wheelbarrow full of notes to buy some butter. The experience of the First World War led to the creation of the League of Nations. This was a kind of precursor to the United Nations of today. It was a forum in which the major powers would discuss issues of contention, global trade and so forth, in a neutral environment. It was intended to resolve all future disputes through diplomacy and reduce the necessity for warfare for nation-states pursuing particular foreign policy goals. Incidentally, the League of Nations ultimately failed, principally due to the fact that the United States refused to join, despite suggesting the idea in the first place. Now back on topic, the First World War also inspired the so-called Pan-European Union. This is an organisation established by some rather eccentric European aristocrats in order to promote a politically unified Europe. This is probably the first point in time we see a recognisable European movement, in the sense that it's working towards a political and economic union with common institutions. Although not particularly influential, it's useful to mention for those reasons. It was ultimately banned during Nazi Germany. Hitler had a very different idea of European integration, in which Europe was essentially synonymous with Germany. This was no United States of Europe. Despite this, however, German Foreign Minister Joachim von Ribbentrop proposed a confederation of Europe in March 1943, as part of the ominously named New Order for Europe under German occupation. Now, some historians have argued that this was primarily a propaganda tool, to assuage fears among Germany's allies, they would be allowed to remain independent following the defeat of Britain and the Soviet Union. Others, meanwhile, have argued that this was a genuine attempt at European unity by the continent's leading fascist intellectuals and political figures. In the aftermath of World War II, Europe was again bankrupted. An iron curtain descended over the centre of the continent and it became a Cold War battleground between the new superpowers, the United States and the Soviet Union. The relevant point here, I would argue, is actually the continental experience of foreign occupation. In the case of Germany and Italy, allied occupation following their defeat. And in the case of France, of course, Nazi occupation and a conflict between collaborators and the resistance. This was an experience that Britain simply didn't have. Whereas in France and Germany today, while there are a few of the older generation with direct memory, the baby boomer generation, of course, will have heard about this experience from their parents. And so there's still a powerful cultural memory of this, the aftermath of European war. I think it's also interesting to note how the Second World War changed Germany's perception of itself. A nationalistic Germany had made several failed attempts to rise in defiance and overturn the existing political order, which it had been a clear threat to from its very inception. However, the realisation of Nazi atrocities, particularly in terms of the Holocaust, have caused Germans to shy away from nationalism, as they have experienced its most extreme form and the destruction it can cause. A sense of national guilt has replaced national pride, a shame and embarrassment about one's own national identity. Germany has therefore become fearful of its own strength, with a desire to remove potential causes of conflict in Europe in the future. It's often noted that Churchill was an early proponent of European integration following the Second World War. He joined the fervent support from the United States, which felt that a united Europe would represent a more effective bulwark against the Soviet Union, and therefore strengthen NATO, the new alliance to resist the Red Menace. Churchill himself declared, We have our own dream and our own task. We are with Europe, but not of it. We are linked, but not combined. We are interested and associated, but not absorbed. Churchill actually proposed a single Anglo-French state during the war. However, it's worth noting that this was purely from what he perceived as a wartime necessity to resist the fascist powers at any cost. With the support of Britain and America, the Treaty of Paris was signed, forming the European Coal and Steel Community, an early predecessor of the European Union. While Churchill was a supporter of European integration, he, and most of the British population for that matter, still saw Britain as separate from any project along these lines. European leaders wanted Britain to lead the project as its strongest power. However, we need to remember that during this period, 
although undergoing the painful process of decolonization, had enormous political, cultural and economic links outside of Europe. Britain traded heavily with the Stirling area, which was an enormous group of countries who either actually used pound sterling as their currency or had their currency pegged to it. We also need to consider the aftermath of several mostly failed attempts at imperial and then later Commonwealth preference, an attempt to establish stronger trade links with the Commonwealth, though these schemes never fully got off the ground due to the objections of free traders, again the Anglo-Saxon model. In 1950, only 10% of Britain's exports went to the six countries of the economic coal and steel community. This was not simple emotional attachment to the Commonwealth and what remained of the Empire. It did not make economic sense for Britain to join, regardless of concerns over sovereignty. During this period, in a rather stark contrast to modern times, the only serious support for European integration in Britain actually came from the far right. Oswald Mosley, the founder and leader of the British Union of Fascists, called for Britain to join Europe in his book Europe as a Nation, which interestingly seems to echo the European Confederation idea proposed by von Ribbentrop that we mentioned earlier. In a similar contrast, it was the militant left that were most strongly opposed to Britain joining any kind of European organisations. The Labour Party leader Hugh Gateskill once claimed that joining the European Economic Community would be the end of a thousand years of history. The trade unions too were extremely fearful that European integration was a threat to workers and socialist politics. So I promise to give you a more meaningful of the historical context behind Brexit that the journalists have not given you. And we're getting there now. The question we need to ask is, what caused Britain to change its mind and join the European Economic Community? Perhaps the most obvious answer, of course, would be the Suez Crisis. For those who don't know, Egypt, newly independent of the British Empire, under their leader Nasser, unilaterally nationalised the Suez Canal. Now you might wonder why that would cause any kind of conflict, but of course the Suez Canal was still vital for British maritime trade and the Suez Canal Zone was a quasi-independent territory still under British control. Britain colluded with Israel and France to mount an invasion and recapture the Suez Canal, which it easily succeeded in doing. However, the United States put huge economic pressure on Britain to withdraw and Britain was forced to comply. This moment was incredibly important. It exposed to the world, and more importantly to the British themselves, that the United Kingdom was no longer a superpower. It's certainly superpower is an often misused term. It comes from political science, but it's generally accepted by historians as well. It basically denotes a class of power above a great power, essentially. It's to do with power projection and the ability to act independently as well as economic and military strength. It has only ever been used to describe the British Empire, the United States and the Soviet Union following the Second World War. However, it became clear following the Second World War that Britain was at that time clearly under immense rapid relative decline. And by this point, it was no longer right to consider Britain a superpower because it could not operate independently. The United States effectively ordered Britain to withdraw and Britain was forced to comply. Therefore, clearly, Britain was no longer a world power of the First Order. When you consider the understandable arrogance and oftentimes even jingoism in British society, their clear understanding of their place in the world was suddenly shattered by this event. Almost within living memory, absolute power had become irrelevant and it was fairly obvious that the former would never return. Despite this realisation, Britain still clung to its free trading Anglo-Saxon model. Britain was still attached to free trade and resented the protectionist economics of the European Economic Community. So in 1960, Britain joined several smaller European countries to form the European Free Trade Association. EFTA was explicitly designed simply to promote European free trade. It was explicitly not a project working towards political unification as the EEC and later European Union did. However, the EEC was enjoying rapid economic recovery and by 1961, the Conservative Prime Minister Harold Macmillan submitted the first British application to join the European Economic Community. This initial membership bid was rejected, however, and represents a stark contrast to the earlier European enthusiasm for British membership and, in fact, a leadership role. French President Charles de Gaulle wanted Europe to become a counterbalance to America and what he perceived as Anglo-Saxonism in general and their free-trading Anglo-Saxon model. He was in favour of a European army, 
and felt that the British were not truly European in the sense that they had no real enthusiasm for political integration. They were merely looking for free trade, which is a fair point. De Gaulle also feared that American enthusiasm for British membership was proof that they saw Britain as a Trojan horse for American influence within an integrated Europe. De Gaulle was also supposedly paranoid about English become the dominant language of the new bloc. However, Britain was ultimately allowed to join the EEC in 1973, but a referendum was held on membership two years later in 1975. The question was, do you think the UK should stay in the European community? Brackets common market. There was an overwhelming 67% yes vote, with only the Shetlands and Western Isles voting no. There are some bizarre parallels with the 2016 referendum. The Labour Party was again split over the issue. There's a definite sense of deja vu, or almost some kind of parallel universe. The Labour Prime Minister, Harold Wilson, went over to Brussels to renegotiate what he felt was a more attractive deal for Britain and subsequently led the Yes campaign. The hard left of Labour, led by Tony Benn, and indeed cheeky young socialist Jeremy Corbyn, despised the common market, considering it a capitalist club and a threat to the jobs of the British working classes and British democracy itself. The Conservative Party under Margaret Thatcher were almost united in their pro-European stance. Large swathes of the press were in favour. Most famously, The Sun declared, we are all Europeans now. Sovereignty was again an important issue in this referendum. Right-winger Enoch Powell joined with socialist firebrand Tony Benn as one of the key figures in the out campaign. Immigration was barely mentioned during the campaign, as freedom of movement didn't come in until the 1992 Maastricht Treaty though this wouldn't have been an issue anyway. With Britain suffering a slower growth rate than the continental economies, emigration of British workers would have been a more realistic concern. Britain's emotional attachment to the Commonwealth and the rest of the English-speaking world again came into play, however through the lens of economics. Inflation was running at 24%, and some blamed the admittedly ludicrous common agricultural policy and common fisheries policies for stopping cheap agricultural imports from entering Britain, for example New Zealand. Incidentally, the price of butter actually quadrupled by 1978, which was more than even the wildest predictions of the No campaign. Attitudes towards Britain's EEC membership cooled rapidly in 1984, when the then Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher railed against British budget contributions, which she perceived as unfair. Although she came back with a rebate, the effects of the protectionism of the common agricultural policy and common fisheries policy saw support for British membership of Europe at its lowest ever level, with 65% wanting to leave. However, it's important to note that before and since, British membership has almost always enjoyed at least a narrow advantage in support. Support for leaving didn't actually take the lead again until 1999, as a result of scepticism over the newly introduced European currency, the euro, which is widely considered to be rather unsuccessful. So to conclude, I think we've clearly got to the root of the ideas behind European integration. However, I also promised to try and give you some new ideas as to the reasons for Britain's ultimate withdrawal from the European Union. However, in some ways, given the context I've given you, I think it's perhaps more of a surprise that Britain joined in the first place, and that's the thing to understand. I think you can see the relationship between Britain and the European Union as something of a clash of cultures, with the small government and low regulation of the Anglo-Saxon model versus the big government protectionism that's inherent in any customs union. We saw that before the British entry in the free trade liberalism of EFTA. Another key reason is what I think de Gaulle was perceiving. Britain shares a common culture with the other English-speaking countries. And perhaps with hindsight, it may always have been more sensible for Britain to join some kind of loose confederation of English-speaking countries. Possibly with Britain and the old dominions forming a single bloc to counterbalance the influence of the United States within such a union. I think this cultural difference though ties in to the experience of the continental powers of occupation and the destruction of two world wars. Britain as an island has been isolated from this and has had maritime trade links with disparate places all over the world. Similarly, Britain's security ties have been with NATO and again the so-called Five Eyes, the English-speaking countries, and not with Europe. Meanwhile, the so-called special relationship and British attachment to the Commonwealth are tied in with the values of liberal democracy that emerged in Britain. The sovereignty of Parliament is just a euphemism for the liberal resistance to tyranny that's been going on since Magna Carta, all the way up to the Glorious Revolution of 1688, and continues an undercurrent in British culture ever since. These ideas were put on the back burner by the economic reality of virtual bankruptcy following two world wars, decolonisation, and a relative decline in, in trade with the Commonwealth. In the context of a rapidly growing European common market, 
it made obvious economic sense for Britain to join in the process of European integration. However, the movement towards ever closer union was always a potential flashpoint. From the very beginning, there were diverging aims. The lack of attachment to the idea of European unity versus France and particularly Germany, where the experience of fascism and the destructiveness of European war have created an earnest drive to abolish the nation state in order to ensure peace. Finally, the fact that Britain remains a great power, with a seat on the United Nations Security Council, the second strongest military power in NATO, including nuclear weapons capability, and the most influential soft power of any country in the world, as well as controlling one of four of the world's reserve currencies, Britain has always had the capacity to follow a free trading liberal model. It's not to say Britain's position is unique. Germany certainly, and probably France and Italy as well, could happily exist as independent powers, even in these times of change and growing powers in the East. But the cultural differences and the differing historical experiences simply mean that they don't have a desire to. Anyway, I tried my best to not get political. I hope I've given you a few ideas that might make you understand this topic a little bit more. And at the very least, I've given you an idea of how far back you can trace these historical currents towards European integration. If you like the video, please like and subscribe.